So what's your take on the most crucial element of cooking? Well, the immediate answer would be taste, right? Yet, the way you phrase it suggests there's more beneath the surface. Enlighten me. Taste indeed holds its own charm. People can't stop raving about Sojiro's curry for its intricate flavors, a complexity I've yet to fully emulate. My own curry, while distinctive in taste, made me realize there's another fundamental aspect I've been exploring, beyond flavor. Any guesses? Given your penchant for the dramatic, I'd wager the soul of the chef or some such. A soul? <laughs> Please, you of all people should know I'm not in the business of having one. Joking aside, you're correct in that you need to pour your heart into your cooking, but we'll come to it later. For now, I'm talking about something more tangible. Texture, Goro. Uh, texture, naturally. Exactly. Have you ever thought about why we enjoy our food? Texture in food is like the unsung hero of a great meal. And just like there are five basic tastes, you can break ingredients down to six different textures. Now, stay silent and pay attention. Can you do that? Of course, senpai. It seems you have yet to realize that I can do anything you claim to master, only better. Hmm, we'll see about that. So, the different texture. First, crunchy. My favorite, although it's not the most prominent in the case of curry. It's that satisfying snap of a perfectly cooked piece of tempura, or the crust of a fresh baguette. The reason why it's so satisfying? It's partly because it's a hearing experience as well as a tasting one, but it's also the resistance, the unexpected joy in breaking through that exterior to discover what lies beneath. Then there's chewy. It's the heartiness of a well-kneaded bread or the firmness of al dente pasta. It makes us work for the flavors, releasing them slowly, as if each chew brings us closer to the essence of the ingredients. Chewiness makes eating engaging, turning passive tasting into an active exploration. Intriguing. I never really thought about texture in such depths. Then the aerated texture, the delightful bubbles in a souffle or a mousse, the lightness, the way food can almost seem to dissolve on your tongue, leaving behind a trace of flavor and a memory of its structure like eating a tasty cloud that you can barely grasp and that leaves you hungry for more. Are we still talking about food, Akira? Creamy. It's the silk of the culinary world. It's smooth, it's comforting. It's the way a scoop of ice cream melts in your mouth or the velvety texture of a well-emulsified sauce. Creamy textures wrap flavors in a blanket, smoothing out their edges and extending their presence on your palate, your tongue your throat. Mmm, I see. Tell me more. Fluid textures, they're the essence of refreshment. The burst of juice when you bite into a ripe fruit. The warmth of a broth that fills your mouth and soul. Fluids carry flavors in their most direct form, unadulterated and pure, demanding nothing but to be savored. And last, but certainly not least, fatty. It's richness, it's decadence, it's the mouthfeel of a perfectly marbled steak or the unctuousness of an avocado. Fat is the forbidden vice that finds its way among the other flavors to envelop your senses in pure satisfaction. Each of these textures, Goro, they interact with our senses in unique ways, blending, contrasting, enhancing flavors. They can evoke memories, emotions, reactions, Sometimes, the texture of a dish can leave a longer-lasting impression than the taste itself. Think of the rice in that sushi you love so much. No matter how well-seasoned it is, you'll find that your mouth pays more attention to how the rice is cooked if it's firm enough, but not dry, just perfectly chewy in harmony with the fish to accompany it on the tongue without being a hindrance. Any questions? Hmm. You know, your rambling about textures is oddly poetic. It's not just the food, is it? 
It's how you approach life. With curiosity, seeking depth in the mundane. I suppose that's what makes you fascinating. The way you find meaning in the simple things. How you perceive and claim what others overlook and make it yours. This newfound nonchalance you've adopted does little to conceal your true self. Surprisingly complex and endlessly intriguing. Mm, careful, detective. Now, you're veering into strange territories. Uh, uh, my apologies, attic trash. Then show me how to cook this stupidly complex curry with actual instructions, instead of nonsensical descriptions of what a French baguette sounds like when you munch on it. <laughs> I love you. All right, let's start. First, crush for me three or four garlic cloves. Three or four? Yeah. Which one is it? Depends on the size, just feel it. What do you mean, just feel it? Isn't a recipe about following precise measurements? Not only that, cooking, especially something as personal as curry, is adapting to what your heart tells you. That's the real secret. And how does that translate into actual instructions rather than metaphors? Let's continue, and you might start to understand. Fine, here are three crushed garlic cloves. What's next? What? You didn't peel them first. My heart didn't tell me anything about peeling them. Oh, an unruly student, I see. All right, we're done with the base. Now, the spices. Here, we have turmeric, coriander, cumin, and a bit of chili powder. And how much of each? That's where you start to feel it. The turmeric for color, coriander for freshness, cumin for that earthy depth, and chili for the kick. Start with a teaspoon of each and adjust from there. Adjust based on what? Taste, smell, intuition. Infuriating. Done with a teaspoon of each. And now? Give it a taste and tell me what you think it lacks to be perfected. Hmm, it's sufficiently spicy. Perhaps the cumin covers up the other flavors too much? Not only, but that's a start. Do you know how to attenuate the cumin's flavor? Not really. You add a countermeasure? Honey? Yes? You can add honey to diminish the cumin's overwhelming presence. It adds a subtle sweetness that balances the spice. And what are you doing now? Is that white chocolate? Boss's recipe uses plain dark chocolate. But after experimenting, Haru advised me to try this white chocolate from Madagascar. It gave better results. It's even smoother. You want your curry to be smooth, not spicy? I want my curry to be a symphony of flavors. So intricate and harmonious that you can't guess where the warmth you feel is coming from. Every bite should be a surprise. A blend of what's expected and the delight of the unexpected. This is definitely you. A blend of shadows and light, complex and infuriatingly unpredictable. Thank you, honey. I like to think of cooking as composing music. Do you remember how you referred to jazz as an erratic synchronicity? In jazz, a musician's mood and interaction with the band influenced the direction of the performance. It's the same with my curry. The mix and balance of spices change with what's at hand or how I'm feeling. Every batch is different, yet it's all curry in the end. As you stated earlier, the chef d'orchestre is the heart, and mine loves improvisation. Hmm. Pardon me for veering into strange territories again, but to be honest, I'm feeling somewhat grateful for your extended explanations and metaphors. People don't really get used to hearing you talk as much as you do now. Most of the time you hardly talk at all, yet here you are, going to great lengths to teach me. Why? No one else requires me to express myself like that. I hope you were paying attention to what I was saying more than my pretty face, though. Or I would have to repeat everything all over again. Such arrogance. Yes, I was listening, but... Improvisation implies a level of 
unpredictability. I prefer my actions to have predictable outcomes. That's exactly the point. Let me show you. When you add turmeric, you're adding color, but you're also infusing warmth, a bit of earthiness. The amount, that depends. Today feels like a two teaspoon day. Tomorrow, who knows? And if it turns out too earthy? Then we learn and adjust. Unlike baking, cooking is pretty forgiving, so don't be afraid of experimenting. About those garlics you crushed earlier. If it feels like a three garlic day, then it is. If your heart whispers four, then who are we to argue? And if my heart is reluctant to share any insights on garlic cloves? Then you borrow insights from those around you, learning to listen closer. The idea is to nourish your soul with every skill you acquire, cooking included. The more you practice, the more you grow and become attuned to it. Nourishing the soul, huh? Does that relate to those social stats Mona sometimes mentions? He... he told you about social stats? Well, you're venturing into metafiction territory. Social stats are pragmatic measures of how others perceive you. What matters is how you perceive yourself. And do you manage to follow that advice? What do you think? Don't answer with another question. Well then, don't ask questions to which you already know the answer. So, you throw in two teaspoons of ground cumin, two teaspoons of coriander, two teaspoons of turmeric, one teaspoon of hey. Tut, tut. You don't need that. Haven't you been listening to the whole part about adapting? But I need a base to start with. Nope. Mm, whoops. Too much coriander. Why are you ruining it on purpose? It's not ruined. What do you think could repair this overwhelming presence of coriander? Um, coriander adds fresh bitterness. So, something deep and sweet? I don't know, wanna try? I've got honey, chocolate, cream. I don't wanna make it worse. And besides, we've already added honey earlier. Isn't it becoming too messy? Just tell me which one it is. Messy is fun, isn't it? It can be any of them. And if the taste still doesn't feel right, we'll keep balancing. Worst comes to worst, we learn for next time, won't we? truly is a die and retry way of cooking. I never would have thought. Interesting choice of words, so? I'm not certain. More honey? More honey on the way. Now give it a taste. It's better. The honey actually smoothed out the coriander without overwhelming the taste. It's that easy? It is. Now, let's think about the texture. How do you feel about the consistency? It seems... A bit too thick for my liking. I'd prefer it slightly more fluid. All right, what do you suggest we add to adjust it? Hmm, water would dilute the flavor too much. Perhaps a bit of coconut milk? Coconut milk, great choice. Go ahead. Mm, smells good. Now about the heat. It's got a kick, but I think it could use a bit more warmth. What do you think? I agree. However, I'm wary of adding more chili powder. It might overshadow the other spices. Right. Let's use fresh ginger instead. It'll add warmth without overpowering the rest. This is actually quite enjoyable. The process of adjusting, tasting, and then adjusting some more. That's the joy of cooking. It's live. It's reactive. You're in a dialogue with your ingredients. A dialogue, huh? Well, in this case, it's quite a heated argument we've been having with our curry for the last hour. I hope he'll forgive my lack of expertise. Ha, <laughs> don't worry. This pot has seen worse. Almost done. Now let's talk garnish. Any ideas? Hmm. Considering the complexity of the curry, something simple. Cilantro leaves, perhaps. Their freshness could elevate the flavors without competing. Cilantro it is, and for a final touch, a squeeze of lime. It'll brighten everything up. I must say, this was an enlightening experience. I've learned to trust not only my senses, but to engage with the process more... Mm, intuitively. And that's what makes it fun. Shall we serve? 
Yes, let's. Thank you for the lesson. So formal. Don't I deserve a thank you kiss? Eh. I will need to fact check what you have been saying to me. Given your reputation, it's possible that it was all nonsense intended to charm me. Did it work? Hmm. Don't ask questions to which you already know the answer. Hey, Sojiro. Haven't seen Wakaba around much lately. Is she caught up at the lab again? Yeah, she's practically living at her lab these days. Barely sees her bed at home. You should have seen her the other day, buzzing with more energy than I've seen in years. She's on to something big, I'll tell you that. Hasn't been this thrilled about her work in, well, ever. Sounds like her, always chasing after the next big discovery. You seem cheerful today. Did something nice happen? Well, um, I guess Goro's smile is rubbing off on me. Huh. So, the man adorned with the crown is the antagonist, I presume. You'll find out. No spoilers from me. Hi there, welcome to the world of Pokémon. My name is Professor Juniper. Everyone calls me the Pokémon Professor. Hmm, oh, this creature she has. Quite adorable. Minchino. Cute but practically useless, despite a commendable speed stat. Fascinating. This world is inhabited by mysterious creatures called Pokémon. No shit. Pokémon have mysterious powers, they come in many shapes and live in many different places. We humans live happily with Pokémons. Living and working together, we complement each other. We help each other out to accomplish difficult tasks. Having Pokémon battle one another is particularly popular, and it deepens the bonds between people and Pokémon. Oh, do humans engage in combat as well? Nope, you have the Pokémon fight on your behalf. You're just the strategist. And these creatures comply purely out of loyalty? That's considerably more grim than I anticipated. Just wait until you dive deeper into the storyline. This version delves into the ethical issues of Pokémon battles more than the others. Uh, I see. Tell me about yourself. Are you a boy or a girl? Uh, that's straightforward. And for the protagonist's name, well, Crow. Not opting for Neo? Before anything else, I am Crow. Uh, and what's this? My rival is a stupid-looking guy with glasses. Haha, <laughs> seems like fate to me. Uh, very well. I've entered the game world. Oh, is this supposed to be my room? Before you really get started, I've got a few general tips for you. I'm all ears. You need to understand the type matchups. You wouldn't send out a fire type against a water type unless you've got a strategy up your sleeve. There's a whole table of type affinity, but aside from rare exceptions, it's pretty logical. Like, water beats fire, fire beats grass, grass beats water. It's the basic triangle of power. I see. So it's akin to chess, predicting your opponent's moves and countering them. Tell me, does this game incorporate elements of deception? For instance, misleading your opponent to believe you're taking one path, only to surprise them with another? Exactly. That's where tactics like status effects and setting up come into play. You can use moves that increase your stats or decrease the opponent's. The base of strategy is guessing your opponent's move, like guessing if they are going to switch their Pokémon and counter with a move that hits the incoming Pokémon hard, or if they are going to resist your attack and make you lose your turn. Ugh, the screen is so tiny and the color so bright. Won't it ruin your eyesight? Worth it for the rush. And hey, a genius behind glasses just adds to the charm. I'll hold you to that statement. He does present a rather compelling argument without them, however. Is that so? That's a first from you. Did I not mention it before? Perhaps I thought it was obvious, but for clarity, I've always found your features to be particularly agreeable unobstructed. As long as I don't spend hours staring at the screen, my eyes should be fine. Now, choosing a starter. Sneevy, Tepig, or Oshawott. Mmm, decisions, decisions. 
Well, Snivy's cool if you like grass types, plus it evolves into Superior, which has a regal vibe. Tepig is cute and turns into a firefighting pig. Then there's Oshawott, who's basically a samurai otter in its final form. Huh. A royal snake, a fighting pig, or a... Uh, a samurai otter, you say? Intriguing. Hmm. I suppose I'll start with Oshawott, then. The concept of a samurai aligns somewhat with my... aspirations. More than the royal snake, I suppose. Good choice. Oshawott's a solid all-rounder. Plus, strategy-wise, you'll want to build a balanced team around your starter. Think about covering weaknesses. You're taking this so seriously, Goro. It's just a game, you know? Even in leisure, there's much to learn and apply. And I can't help but notice the similarities to certain aspects of our lives. You notice too? How Mona's passionate pursuit of sushi resembles a samurai otter. Hey! <laughs> hey, we'll make a Pokemon master out of you yet. Just wait till you get to the competitive battling scene. That's a whole other world. Uh, Ryuji. Yusuke! What's with that face, bro? Your presence strikes me as novel, almost as though my eyes are truly open for the first time in ages. How do you fare? Doing awesome, man. You heard Anne's birthday's coming up, right? Figured we could throw her a bash. You're the king of cool designs and stuff, so you in? A celebration for Anne? Indeed, that sounds like an occasion I might contribute to. However, shall we invite the entirety of our assembly? That's kind of the plan, yeah. But there's a hitch. Akechi's mentioned Akira's been... off. Kinda isolating himself. Says he's feeling down, sorta lonely-like. It's weird, since he ain't reaching out or anything, but... Keichi thinks getting the gang together might cheer him up. What's your take? Their concern for one another is palpable. However, I shall respectfully abstain. Akira harbors the illusion that I am his rival for Goro's affections and I have no desire to once again become a casualty of his capricious nature. Wait, what? R rival? Dude, you into that too? My interests do not align in any particular direction. Nevertheless, Akira's perception is distorted, his desires clouded to the extent of potential recklessness. While I cherish our camaraderie, my personal safety is at stake. Akira's company holds a certain volatility for me. Man, I get Akira can be a tough nut to crack, but he ain't gonna hurt you. Dude's like the chillest person I know. Why not just clear the air with him? He stole one of my artworks, subsequently threatening that should I continue to associate artistically with Goro, my canvases would be stained with my own blood. What? The hell's gotten into him? Akechi knows about this. Indeed, he is aware. Subsequent to his intervention, the painting was returned to me. Alas, Akira ensured our paths did not cross during its restitution, signaling that any hope for reconciliation remains... distant. Damn, that's messed up. But what about Anne? Won't she wonder why you're not there if we're all together and you're MIA? You raise a valid point. This extends beyond mere personal grievances. Allow me some time to ponder. Cool, just think about it, yeah? And Akira really needs to get his shit together. He can't just say stuff like that even if he's jealous or whatever. I mean, what the hell? Indeed, the heart's labyrinth is complex and fraught with shadows. One can only hope that Akira finds his way through the darkness. Hmm. Um, what are you doing? You've reset that game at least a dozen times now. Oh, this? I'm hunting for a shiny starter. They're super rare and have different colorations than normal ones. I'm collecting them. Huh, so you're not continuing the story until you get that shiny? Are they stronger than normal ones? Nope, they're just colored differently. But you can brag about them afterwards, or in my case, let them rot in a PC box forever. It's more about the thrill of the hunt, you know? The thrill of turning your console on and off a thousand times in a row? I see. You're playing an entirely different game, aren't you? Yep. You've got to have patience and a bit of luck. 
But imagine starting the game with a shiny. It'd be epic. Ugh. As much as I enjoy watching you two, I think I'll take a cat nap until dinner. Wake me up when it's ready, will you? Oh, we're out of apples? Hmm. How long does this usually take? The odds must be astronomical. Oh, about 1 in 8,192. Pretty standard for shiny hunting. That's quite the commitment to chance just to have a Pokemon with different colors. Uh, since you'll be tied up with this for who knows how long, I'll be ahead of you in the adventure, won't I? Can't be helped! But, you know, last time I got one in only two days, so who knows? Um... Let's consider this logically. Each reset takes you about 40 seconds, right? And there are 3,600 seconds in an hour, so that equates to 90 attempts in an hour. Assuming you dedicate 9 hours a day to this endeavor after accounting for a minimum of 6 hours of sleep, 8 hours of school, and an hour for various breaks, that totals to... 810 attempts per day. Ha! Huh. Bold of you to assume I don't shiny hunt at school. Um... Hmm, <clears throat> nope, said nothing. Nine hours a day is legit. Hmm. Now, considering the odds of not encountering a shiny Pokemon are 8,191 out of 8,192 for each attempt, the true test is the cumulative probability over time. Over the span of a week, which amounts to seven days, you'll have made 5,670 attempts. Let's round it up to 6,000, since I can play more on weekends. All right, then. If we calculate the cumulative probability across those 6,000 attempts, that is 8,191 divided by 8,192 raised to the power of 6,000, then the probability of encountering at least one shiny Pokémon under your strict regimen stands at approximately 51.9% at the end of the week. <sighs> That's quite the dedication you have here. Huh. Hmm. You should prepare for the unexpected. Ready when you are, Joker. Pay attention to your health. You truly are impressive. Well, this is a problem. Let me handle this. So this is how you operate. This is amazing. I don't understand. Why are we all on standby while Crow gets to be on the front line with Joker throughout the entire operation? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I'm just itching for a good fight, too. Why is Crow getting all the action? The less he knows about our full strategies, the better. It'll give us an advantage when he decides to turn against us. We might even end up having to confront him. It does make sense. Sounds legit. Gotcha. Heh. <laughs> you really are always ten steps ahead, Akira. Thinking of every possible scenario. Understood, leader. We will trust your judgment. The shadows here are getting more and more serious about eliminating us. Why are you making this so dangerous? Please... Be more careful. You're making this harder for us than it needs to be. This is starting to piss me off. Do you have a moment? I was wondering, why is it just the two of us leading the charge? Wouldn't rotating the full roster of thieves give us an advantage? Does that bother you? My concerns aren't personal discomfort, but isn't this your last heist together? As a full team, I mean. It's also the first and last operation we're running with you. There's significance in that. But we still have room for two more on the front line, and... Crow. Do you think the Phantom Thieves and I have made it this far by second-guessing my strategies? Huh. Obviously not. Now you're my rival, Crow. And as it stands, you're three kills behind. Keep up, newbie. 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 Newbie, huh? Newbie. But, considering...
considering I'm resetting for three Pokemon simultaneously with each attempt, the three different starters, in effect, I'm making 18,000 encounters in that week. So, with that in mind, my probability of encountering at least one shiny Pokemon goes up to approximately 88.9%. So easy peasy. Easy peasy, indeed. Your calculation prowess rivals my own. That's impressive. What can I say? I've been in the shiny hunting business since before you were born. That's... Anyways, should I wait for a whole week then? Akira, since it appears Futaba will be occupied with her quest for some time, perhaps you'd be interested in purchasing the complimentary version. We could undertake this Pokemon adventure together. Aren't we a bit old to be starting Pokemon adventures? This coming from the man who shed tears over finding Bimo yesterday. Hey, that movie has layers, okay? But while we're on the subject of movies, have you heard about the one coming out next week? John Mick? Hmm, John Mick? Isn't that the new movie with Renu Keeves? What's it about? Yeah, it's about this guy who goes on a rampage because someone kidnapped and killed his cat. Sounds like a classic in the making. A man avenging his cat, huh? I don't know. I had an idea that maybe we could have some fun in the planetarium sometime soon. Akira, once you're done there, could you help me with groceries? I just realized we're short on a few things for tomorrow's curry. <sighs> sure thing. Guess our Pokemon adventure will have to wait a bit. Uh, I suppose I will be doing this on my own for a little while longer then. Oh, what's this little shit? Lily pup? Huh, I'm going to name this one Akira. Whoops, killed it. Next time, I guess. What if we just start a war on the other side of the world? Distract Maruki, spread his resources thin. That is remarkably reckless. And here I was, thinking that cooking with Akira was the most perilous part of my day. But think about it. Maruki would have to pay attention, and you'd get a clear shot. While the strategic distraction holds merit, the ethical implications are... troubling. We're not aiming to replace one tyrant with another. Oh, please. Since when did you care about ethics, Mr. I've killed before and I do it again? Touché. But believe it or not, there's a certain thrill in outmaneuvering our adversaries without resorting to brute force. It's akin to play chess on a global scale, and I intend to win this game without sacrificing pawns needlessly. Huh. Didn't take you for the sentimental type. Don't mistake my pragmatism for sentimentality. Besides, causing international incidents is a tad gauche, don't you think? So, what's your grand plan then? Sit around and wait? Well... Unlike many missions in the past, we are lucky that we don't have a deadline. The stakes are immense, Futaba. And I don't need to remind you what Maruki can do with our memories. So yes, for now, we'll lay low, gather information, and I'll strengthen my bonds with others to awaken the entire crew when they're ready to face the truth. Maruki won't stay in Japan forever. His goal is to actualize the world, and apparently his physical presence plays a part in that. It will give Dr. Ishiki time to dissect her findings in the cognitive world as well, and for you to figure out how you feel about me regarding what I've done. Hmm. You're playing a long game, huh? And you're dragging my feelings into this now? That's low, even for you. Consider it an acknowledgement of the elephant in the room. We can't afford to be at odds, not when so much is at stake. Yeah, well, acknowledgement doesn't change the past. Nothing can change the past, Futaba. I'm not looking for your forgiveness. I wasn't able to forgive Shido for the role he played in my mother's death. So I don't see why you should feel any different. Let's just focus on dealing with Maruki. As long as I have something to keep my mind busy, I'll work on it. If laying low is the strategy for now, I'm on board. But make no mistake, you need to be clear on where you stand. 
Your behavior's been oddly erratic since that encounter with Maruki. I understand your concern. Don't worry. There are only two things I know for sure in this rotten life. I don't make the same mistakes twice. And what I feel doesn't matter. In my fight to uncover the truth. E, you... You owe me, Neo. When I strike that deal with you, I wasn't aware of the whole picture, as you said. I want to reconsider the terms of our deal. I'm listening. You're going to help me find a way to keep my mom even in the true reality. She isn't a cognition or a projection or anything. She's in the same situation you are. And Morgana said that if enough people believe you're real, you'll be. Even with Maruki out of the picture. But it was an unfounded theory, Futaba. Last year when you learned the truth, your mother... Yeah, because... She was here solely because of my belief, but, but now nearly a year has passed. She's interacted with others, worked, lived. She exists for me and for the world, Maruki's reality notwithstanding. If, if she's real, then my reasons for hating you take a back seat, aside from your awful personality. Futaba, when I awakened Yusuke to his past memories, Madarame was returned to custody, regardless of his interactions. The truth is immutable. Defeating Maruki will return us to our rightful states. It's inevitable. If Maruki can do it, we can do it too. Keep my mother alive. If I understand you correctly, you don't feel remorse for your murders. That's what you told me. And that makes you the cruelest, most despicable person I've ever met. And an apathetic monster. Akira? He's the same. Forcing me into this dream when I chose to close my eyes and face the truth. You're both awful. The only person in this world I have any faith in is my mother. And right now you're giving her all the keys she needs to realize her dream. To understand the cognitive world. The dream she... she was robbed of. I know you don't really need her. You don't need anyone. You just want to die, like a coward, right? <laughs> but you're fighting to fix things and make a difference. Unlike Akira, that gives you enough points for me to consider your side as well. So I won't let you down, I'll keep my feelings in check, and I'll trust you. If you do everything in your power to find a way for me to keep my mom, no matter what. Do you understand? You're asking me to bend the very fabric of reality. And to rewrite the rules of existence based on what we wish to be true. Just like Maraki did. It's not a matter of what I want, or don't want, for myself. It's about the immutable laws that govern our world. Keeping your mother alive would create a paradox, Futaba. What about all the memories you made with the Phantom Thieves? The bonds you formed, the years you spent growing up, the strength and power you gained from what you felt. Do you really want to give that up? And... And your mother herself. Her memories are all created by Maruki to fit the narrative he created for you. Is that really what you want? I'm... I'm a hacker. I break into systems that are designed to be unbreakable. We're already doing what seemed impossible, right? Why can't we use our skills for something good, like fixing a real wrong? The cognitive world is where thoughts shape reality, right? Then there's got to be a way to keep my mom here, for real, and all my souvenirs. Akira kept all his memories, your death included, and clearly remembers the grief and the moments you weren't there too. And yet, here you are. So can we at least try? I understand. And what... What does your mother know about your situation? I... 
I told her about the mix-up of my memories, and I think she guessed enough to believe that it's related to her. But I'm afraid that if... Uh, if I say it out loud or say the wrong stuff, she'll just... disappear. I see. Do you think she would agree with your decision? I... I don't think she would. She would want me to be braver and face the truth. But I'm not as strong as she thinks. You're wrong, Futaba. You have it in you. I've seen you last year. How strong and courageous you are, deep down inside of you. Believe me, I know how painful the truth can be. There's a reason I've been acting strangely since my meeting with Marquis. And there's a reason I said I felt no remorse for most of my targets. Not all of them. I... honestly didn't expect the fate of your mother. Shido told me that according to her research, killing a shadow self would put the person into a coma, not end their life. What I want to say is that if Maruki had really granted me my own wish, then I would be with my mother right now as well. Wanting her to be by your side doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. Just like learning your lessons and believing in what your heart tells you. I hate that I can't hate you, Akechi. Then don't, Futaba. Hate is not a prerequisite for change, nor for understanding. It's a burden. One less thing for you to carry. And if it makes you feel any better, I bear a greater loathing for myself than you could possibly muster. Let's focus on what's important. Moving forward. Let's find out what we want for ourselves, for your mother, and the outcome of what we are trying to do with this reality. What I want. It's, it's impossible to reconcile everything. I... I have to make a choice, don't I? Indeed, but there's no rush. This decision isn't trivial. I don't want you looking back with regret, Futaba. Consider all angles. And... Whatever your decision, whether to try to keep her by your side no matter what, or to return everything to its authentic state, I will respect your choice. It's the least I can do for you. Remember in episode 83 of season 3? where Pink Argus had to choose between saving the android of her dead sister or saving the entire world? I always thought she was so dumb for even hesitating. Save the world, obviously. It wasn't even really her sister, right? Just a robot, acting and talking like her. But now... Featherman heroes always find a way, don't they? They face impossible odds, make tough decisions, but... Somehow they pull through. They never win by just standing still, or let themselves be imprisoned by their stupid feelings. They move forward, together, believing in each other and the future they want to create. For justice. You're quite right. Maybe we're in our own episode of Featherman. And maybe it's okay to not have all the answers right now. As long as we keep fighting, right? You make it sound like you're as lost as I am. Has Maruki really been messing with your head? I am going to be entirely honest with you. For the first time in my whole life, I am clueless. Whether it was his words, or something beyond, that caused the hopelessness I feel now, how would I know? I'm sure I can't remember any occasion when he used his powers on me. That said, he was right in many arguments he opposed and his words gave credence to theories I'd rather dismiss. And yet, deep down, I'm still willing to fight. 
Because if I don't, what else am I supposed to do? What's my place in this world? Neo didn't take the blue pill, you know? I know. And Pink Argus chose to do what was right as well. Yeah, you're right. <laughs>